Welcome. Nice to be here. Um, I've been teaching online this last spring, and this is the first time I've had a live audience in like three or four months. So anyway, it's great to be before you here. Um, I did have you read a, section, a chapter from Ira Berlin's book, Many Thousands Gone. Uh, how many did read it? Whoa. I was going to say there's going to be a quiz after, but you probably know more than I do, so I, I'll dispense with the quiz. Um, listen, what I, I want to cover just a few things this morning. Um, one, looking at, again, uh, Sheila mentioned the park, um, the Lowell National Historical Park had a conference um, in the early 1990s called The Meaning of Slavery in the North. And part of the reason for that conference, which was to bring together a number of fairly significant scholars in the field, was to get the Park Service to start thinking about how it might uh, interpret slavery, and especially in relation to Lowell, the, slave, the cotton slave plantations um, in, the, in the Black Belt, which I'll be talking about. So, and then there is, in fact, um, a book that came out of that conference um, called The Meaning of Slavery in the North. And I don't think that was a suggested reading for this group, was it? No, it was not, but it's on the table upstairs. And there actually is a very good, very short chapter, but really nicely done by Thomas O'Connor. And uh, Tom O'Connor, I believe actually he died very recently, but he was really the foremost Boston historian, that's histori historian of Boston, especially the Boston Irish. But uh, O'Connor had written a book in the 1960s called uh, Lords of the Loom, Lords of the Lash. Maybe it was just Lords of the Loom. But anyway, um, this, this essay that he, that he uh, wrote and he presented at the conference is kind of his rethinking about the whole relationship between the, um, you know, the, the cotton wigs in the New England and the slaveholders in the South. So I really, it's a nice, nicely well-written, very short essay. And I, I think it also reflects you know, Tom's many years of thinking about the subject. So I really recommend that. Um, I'm, I, I realized I, when I actually did quickly reread Ira Berlin's a chapter uh, this morning, um, he, he talked about, the, again, you might recall, the lower Mississippi area, uh, specific, specifically New Orleans. And um, so, but he really is looking at this very much earlier period, um, really in the late 18th century, when, um, you know, as you probably read, there really was a movement, of course, in the North, but also in the South for manumitting slaves. And there even was kind of a kernel of hope that perhaps um, that slaves, that, that slaves would, be, would be liberated, at least many of them, and would have their freedom, freedom and enjoy really the fruits of this new republic. And of course, as we know, that didn't happen. I'm going to touch on again why, some of the reasons why that didn't happen this morning. But, um, but so really, uh, Ira Berlin's chapter that I had you read really kind of lays the groundwork for this region in the South that I'm going to be talking about. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on the post-1790s period. Again, and I'll talk a little bit. Perhaps, do you teach about um, invention, innovation, Eli Whitney and the cotton gin? So um, I'll touch on that too. But you can't make, really can't make too much about you know, the Yankee capital and Yankee uh, innovators who played a very large role in um, strengthening uh, the slave society in the South. So that's something I think to keep in mind when we think about Lowell, we think about New England textiles, um, we think about Yankee capital and Yankee innovators, is the role they played in the slave economy in the South. So the other thing I like to say, I, you know, I used to love PowerPoint. You know, when I first started doing it a few years ago, and then, I don't know, I mean, I've got it kind of tired, tired of it. You know, it becomes kind of like, you know, this exercise in passivity, right? The, the lights go down, and, um, but, so I really like to have this be more of a, uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you have a different perspective on things, I'd really be interested in hearing from you. So feel free to interrupt me. I've got probably too damn many slides to show anyway. And if I don't finish, so be it. But um, really, it's, for me, it's very much more interesting to have a kind of a conversation with you. So what I'll do, I'd like to cover really three or four things. Again, look at the, the rise of the cotton slave society uh, in the South. Um, followed by a quick discussion, which again, some of you probably teach in the age of Jackson, the market revolution. Do you teach that as well? You know, basically the transition to capitalism, which occurs, of course, l largely in the North, but the South is also part of that market revolution as well. Um, I'll move from there then to some connections between um, the New England textile industry, very specifically in Rhode Island, and the Southern slave plantations. And then I'll close with perhaps a somewhat long, and maybe this is where maybe too localist kind of history, but I'll talk about Lowell and some of the uh, activities in Lowell around the anti-slavery movement and the meaning of slavery for those citizens in Lowell, and again, in the pre-Civil War period. So with that, any questions or comments? I'll, yes? 
It's actually a question I asked yeah. earlier when we were going through. Um, were the the owners of the factories, I mean, because abolition was larger here, obviously, in Massachusetts and New York and other states, were they upset um, vocally about that? Because obviously, yes, <laughs> they were. Were and they vocal about it? Or they, or? they were, and occasionally bordering on some violence. Uh, and so I'll actually be covering that. And uh, I, I do want to, if I can, get, by the way, I'm going to be joining you for a walking tour on Friday. And so some of the same sites that you're going to see on the slides, we'll actually be walking by and talking about. And one of them uh, does concern an incident which I'm going to talk about when Garris, William Lloyd Garrison came to Lowell um, for, I believe, the second time and was and with uh, 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 George Thompson, the very famous uh, British abolitionist, and was met with a very violent crowd. Um, and I'll talk about that. So, all right, so good. Off we go then. Okay, so again, let me f start about focusing on cotton and slavery in the South. And um, I've tried to, uh, I believe strongly in crediting images where I you know, have them so you can actually make reference and go back to the source later on. I haven't done that throughout, so just beware. But there, there are some wonderful, um, you know, there's just so much online now, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, so, but, you know, I can also, um, Sheila has my email address, and if you want to contact me about any images or some of the, there, there are some great blogs out there now, I tell you. You know, you hear of civic journalism where people are, you know, in various, various quality, various straits, you know, talking about politics and so forth, but there's also a lot of um, citizen historians out there now who are writing, you know, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. But um, it's really, can, for a classroom teacher, it can really uh, provide a wealth of, of visual and even um, sound and, uh, you know, uh, videos, too. Um, somebody, a, a blog had done something on, you know, cotton plantations and had a uh, clip from Lead Belly's tune, A Bale of Cotton, you know. So I thought about including that today, but I thought maybe I'm kind of borrowing from this teacher. So uh, anyway. Um. Okay, so you probably know, again, from reading uh, Berlin's book, and his book also um, that he wrote many years before called Slaves, um, uh, Slaves Without Masters, where he talks about, he writes about the free slaves in the South. And um, the fact is that in the 1780s and 1790s, both in North and South, there was a, a, a rise, you know, in the wake of the uh, revolution, um, the Constitution, uh, you know, the coming together of the nation, um, there was a rise in the number of slaves manumitted in the North and South. Of course, Massachusetts was the first state to outlaw slavery in the 18, uh, 1780s, but th uh, many other northern states then followed. So there was, in fact, a rise in uh, freeing slaves, uh, but that changed quite dramatically, and most people, uh, many historians argue that cotton played a large role in strengthening the uh, slave society, slave economy, and again, kind of uh, moving against the tide toward freeing the slaves. So um, uh, some of you, again, teach about Eli Whitney. You probably know, um, I believe he was Connecticut born. He attended Yale. He apparently was, a, um, actually, I think he was born in Massachusetts, I should say, um, attended Yale. Um, he was known as a youngster, um, as a kind of a tinkerer. Uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, there was a biography written of Whitney after he died, which embellishes and perhaps uh, adds to a lot of the lore of Whitney. But, but he studied at Yale, and he was not, you know, in, Yale, of course, didn't have an engineering program at the time, so he studied more, kind of, if you will, like the arts and humanities and the classics. But right after, he, he, and he was also an extremely accomplished student, and I believe the president there was the Reverend Benjamin Stiles, and he saw Whitney as kind of one of his prized students and sent him down to become a teacher in uh, South Carolina. Uh, so kind of interesting where, you know, this, by the way, it was, of course, a private academy. This, this is in the 1790s after he finishes at Yale. He goes down to, uh, uh, follow, goes with a family. He didn't have a lot of money. In fact, he borrowed money from this family that he traveled with to go to a plantation right outside of Savannah before he was going to take his teaching job. And um, so, but while he's at the plantation, uh, he, his friend, in fact, that he's down there with is helping to manage this plantation. <laughs> And Whitney, in fact, begins to see that, well, wait, processing cotton, raw cotton out of the field, he starts to tinker with, you know, the kind of a gin with, uh, as you, know, you might know, with the, the kind of the sawtooth. And actually, he's very successful in creating essentially a kind of a prototype. Um, he, uh, his friend actually writes to Thomas Jefferson and uh, actually then has in 1794 Eli Whitney's gin um, patented. 
it becomes, uh, it, Whitney returns to Connecticut, in fact, to New Haven, to, to produce the uh, cotton gin. There are many competitors, by the way, including in the South, that are copying or even have kind of similar ideas. And the reason, perhaps, why uh, Whitney is accredited with being you know, like the father of the inventor of the cotton gin is because he wins a major lawsuit, you know, a, a patent infringement lawsuit. So he becomes really the face behind the cotton gin. And you know, perhaps rightly so, even though there were others. And the fact is that this technology diffuses throughout the South. And the gin, though, becomes an extremely efficient way. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of skilled labor to operate a cotton gin. So, uh, and you can see again, this is, uh, you can see slave labor actually operating a small hand gin there on the left. So the, um, the, the cotton pl plantations boom. There is an in, um, insatiable uh, uh, demand for cotton. And I'll, I'll show you a, a graph later on, but not only in the US, but primarily in England and Europe. Mostly Great Britain is the major consumer of raw cotton. Again, it's processed um, in or near the plantations. These gins were kind of centers. Not every plantation had a gin. They were actually businesses that establish that uh, you know, are, are centers for, for ginning cotton. Um, and then the cotton, of course, is then transported generally to the river where it's shipped by boat to New Orleans or Savannah, New York City, or Boston. Steve, I'm sorry, the portrait that was painted in the line, that was by the regular like, Morris did it? That's did right, that's the, the Samuel F.B. Yeah. Morris, right, did the portrait. Um, also a famous painter. So again, you can see cotton production really uh, climbing dramatically from the early, you know, 1800 to 1860. And then again, this is the this is in 1850. So you can see kind of the intensity of cotton production. And again, this area that you see, uh, kind of throughout the the middle part, you know, through Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, down into Texas, um, it's known as the Black Belt. Then there's a laser printer here. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, again, you can see again, one of the things you also see happening is, uh, of course, slavery is outlawed, um, slave, importation of slaves is outlawed in 1808 by an act of the Constitution approved by, the Congress votes to end the slave trade in uh, 1808. But um, the slave population grows dramatically and it's a, you know, a native increase. And there's tremendous amount of selling and move, movement of slaves from the upper south into the uh, lower south, into the Black Belt. And you can see here, for example, th these slaves on the left in this, this uh, um, handbill advertising the, slave, the, the, sale of, the sale of slaves off the coast of uh, South Carolina. Um, south Car uh, Charleston was a major center for the slave trade. And you can see kind of interesting what, what, uh, how, how the uh, field hands are described there. And then, of course, the slave auction in Charleston. This is in the 1850s. So. So again, you can see that uh, just like you know, cotton goods or anything in America, any commodity, and slaves are considered, of course, a commodity, their prices you know, rise and fall. But generally, it's on an upward trend um, up, up, up until the Civil War. Yeah, on, that, on that prior graphic, yeah. um, are those standardized dollars that we're looking at? I mean, like, is that, do we know, or is that the price in that day? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Ingerman. Yeah. yeah, but you know, uh, yeah, it just knowing Ingerman though, he has probably got a probably what is a a, a, a normal um, a standard met a metric that so so in other words, this is pretty standardized, so it doesn't re reflect you know the rise and fall of, of the currency or inflation. Eighteen hundred dollars. I've done the. Where in today's dollars it's between like twenty five and thirty thousand for uh, for a young male. Uh -huh. and kids are always shocked by that. Yes. As well. Actually, I think I can see even in a magazine I had like Judas Classic or something that showed that it's like twenty five, thirty thousand. Sure. In today's dollars. Well, it's, it's like a new car, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Right. A very. I, I was using the relationship to show you're not going to just beat to death your new car. I mean, you're going to try to use the labor. That's that's, that's very much correct. That blows up the myth of like you know. Yes. Right. Yes. Would you ascribe the, the peak and fall there to the credit bubble before the panic? Well, yes, that's a good point because, in fact, you know, a lot of the, with the, the slave economy, the, the, you know, cotton prices are generally climbing up until the Civil War, and it, it really it's they're just 
it's like you know finding gold in the fields. Um, but there definitely is a, a rise and fall, you know, in the southern economy that relates to the larger market economy too. So again, you can see, um, looking in the, you know, the, the slave population uh, basically uh, almost triples between 1820 and 1860. And then note again in the lower south the rise from you know about half a million to two and a half million slaves from the, over this 40-year period. So a tremendous amount. And you can see too, here's a good uh, kind of a graphic showing the density of the slave population from 1820 to 1860. So again, you know, this is, this is really, this is the black belt, the cotton belt here. Okay, let me just talk, you know, often we overlook, we, we, we talk so much about Lowell and industrialization. We often forget about the relationship between the transition to capitalism and industrial development industrial society. Um, and so again, some of you probably teach about the market revolution. Um, this was a very, you were at Sturbridge Village yesterday, and I think what they were trying to do there is show you know, this change from a largely agrarian um, subsistence, almost a bartering kind of economy, to a more formal economy you know, that's based on contract, based on law, and based on the cash nexus. Okay, and the kind of the changes that, that, that are brought about by that shift again, from a primarily rural agrarian economy that is more informal, perhaps, to a more formal, um, increasingly urban-centered economy. Even though, again, we'll talk, you know, basically during this period, America is still overwhelmingly a rural country, a rural nation. So, you know, you, you probably teach, too, a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the Embargo Act of, of 1807, the Napoleonic Wars, um, this creates a demand for cotton goods uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S. And the number of mills that spring up in New England at this time really is, is unprecedented. Um, so some of you might, are you, is anybody here from Southern Mass or uh, Rhode Island, that area? Probably there. Okay. Yeah, okay, all right. So I don't know if you've been to Slater Mill and uh, have you? I, I, I've seen it, I've never <laughs> like toured it. Okay, yeah. yeah. But the Blackstone Valley, again, is part that goes up from you know, Providence up into Worcester. The number of cotton mills there, not weaving, but spinning cotton, um, increases by like uh, tenfold over this you know, uh, 1807 to 1815 period. Um, and the, you know, so basically, Atlantic commerce is, is uh, halted during this time. And it sparks an, a, a domestic demand for all kinds of, of, of commodities, including cotton. And okay, so again, there's also, as we all know, you know, the world that Jefferson and Hamilton play in um, supporting government support of infrastructure. Um, and federal government plays some role, but it's the state governments that play a much larger role. And you think about the, the Erie Canal, um, you know, Governor DeWitt Clinton, he actually tried to get the feds to uh, provide some funding for um, the Erie Canal. I think Madison it was that basically turned him down. So this New York State funded the uh, Erie Canal. Um, and so, again, this is changing not only commerce, but social relations as well. You know, it's, it's really kind of shortening, if you will, distances between people. The, the Erie Canal, who, who's from New York State here? You, you probably teach a bit about the Erie Canal. It's a totally. We even have a song. <laughs> <laughs> we have a song. Right. Did we, did we hear just a few yeah. hours? Go ahead. You want to sing a few bars? We got an old her name is Sam. Right. <laughs> so you know the, the Erie Canal is just it, it basically cuts you know commerce the, the, the price of shipping goods by of, of from like a hundred dollars from you know uh, New York to Buffalo to about ten dollars per ton. So really quite a dramatic decrease in the uh, cost of shipping goods. And of course we also know the changes that occur along the canal, the rise of the canal boatmen the movement of people, young, mostly many of them young men, searching for a greater fortune. Um, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, shanty towns that develop along the canal in places like Utica and Rome and Buffalo and... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the canal runs, what, 360 some miles and um, I don't, how, many, how, many, uh, how long does it take to go from New York to Buffalo? Do you know um, on the canal? Seven hours. <laughs> Seven hours. Yeah, I think it would take at least a week on the old canal. But that was almost, you know, uh, for, mo for many, 
that was remarkable speed to ship goods. You know, you could have uh, uh, raw oysters in New York, and you could be eating them in Buffalo in the next weekend. So, quite remarkable. <laughs> yeah, well, only in the winter time. That's why. Remember, oysters. You eat them in the months ending with an R. Okay, so again, trends, thinking about the rising internal trade and commerce, the, uh, Massachusetts is a leading state in chartering banks. And we'll have, I have a, uh, an image of Nathan Appleton later on, who's foremost in finance and banking. And of course, again, with the, um, just some, this is some of the significances of, of the uh, market revolution, rapid economic growth and development. And again, this transition from uh, subsistence or semi-subsistence and bartering economy to a more formal economy based on cash and contract. And I just, I love this image is of this uh, you know, shopkeeper wondering what to do with a, a dead chicken. What does that look like about their tax online? Looks like she's reaching into the bag of goodies there. And again, so this, you know, places um, throughout New England, the mid-Atlantic, um, even in the southern cities, start producing all kinds of goods for consumption. We're not so much relying on, you know, British and European goods, uh, domestic goods, uh, household goods. Those are in increasingly being produced in the United States. Even though, it's funny, you know, Europe still has, and, and Britain in particular, had this great reputation for the finest of domestic goods like China, cloth, finest yarns. So, you know, America still is relying on kind of the homespun or the cheaper goods, um, but they are cheap. They are inexpensive. And they, well, now China is outdoing us in that realm. Uh, so, again, uh, again, we're think about the fact, too, that, that during this time, during the market revolution, that even though cities are growing, places like Lowell, which were just, you know, farm areas, practically overnight are becoming cities, the nation is still largely a, a, a rural agrarian community, a population. And again, there's also, again, a rising middle class. Um, it's Lowell, I should say, too, you know, you think about the market revolution and you think about Lowell, it, it, it kind of embodies the market revolution at the same time it stands kind of apart from it because it is unique in that it was an industrial village, an industrial city from the very beginning. And it had, as we know, primarily a female workforce and a female population. But you know, gradually, uh, really, uh, by the 1840s, when it's the second largest city in Massachusetts, there is, in fact, a small but growing middle class. Um, there were about, in, I think in 1840, there were about 5,000 school-aged children going to public schools in Lowell. So again, you see this kind of emergence of a small middle class, primarily made up of, of, of clergy, lawyers, shopkeepers, um, some uh, who are business owners who are supplying goods to the textile mills. So it's a small but um, uh, you know, distinctive middle class, but by far the dominant class is the, this emerging working class made up first of, of Yankee, mostly single women, and then um, beginning again in the 1840s and 50s, um, Irish who are coming in large numbers to the United States. Okay, so I think we all know too that um, with opportunity um, and uh, you know, the chance for wealth comes struggle, difficulty for many. So while many are rising, many who perhaps were small artisans and were successful or were the sons of artisans find it very difficult to maintain that kind of life and livelihood. So again, the, the, the subject of booms and busts, and again, these are some wonderful cards. Some of these are available. This is from the Library of Congress, and the LC has really some wonderful images, um, cartoons and whatnot to, to draw from. But basically, you know, here's a, a, the wife, the, the, the forlorn wife, um, saying that she needs some food, not for herself, but for her children. Here's the, uh, you know, the rent collector at the door, and here's the poor, hapless husband who was out of work, and his fortunes are sinking rapidly. What's kind of interesting is that this actually shows you not a working family as such, but essentially a, a middle class family. So, you know, these economic downturns, these booms and busts affected workers most severely, but it certainly affected um, members of the, the, this emerging middling or middle class. And again, so this social economic dislocation, again, to talk about Lynn, Lynn Massachusetts is a classic example of where you had the many small 10 footers where shoemakers made, you know, a certain number of shoes with their um, apprentices. 
and with their journeymen. And again, by the 1840s and 50s, many of these artisans are now working in shoe factories. I suppose in a way it's a little bit like the, the um, homespun cotton um, that you see, you know, made obviously in farm, farms and in uh, farmsteads. And um, they are quickly being, you know, they're being outcompeted by, with the advent of the power loom in places like Lowell and other mills in Rhode Island. So, I mean, can you imagine it's quite a shift from being, you know, a, a, a competent, independent artisan to working for wages in a factory? Yeah. Did Ben footer refer to the size of the room or the number of shoes? It's typically a, 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 a master shoemaker would have a, a, a house, you know, a fairly, you know, not massive house, but a fairly good sized house. And in the yard would ha he'd have a small working shed which was about 10 feet. And that's how they got the name the 10-footer. So the production would actually occur um, not in the house, but in a small building alongside the house. OK, this is the wonderful graphic that yours truly created here. And I just wanted to show you that. So you see, again, this is a shift from the 1780s to the 1860s, where um, you can see this movement from Artisans, to some, in fact, were successful. Some of the shoemakers in Lynn became very successful. A few became very successful owners of factories. Um, a, a, a larger number, though, um, you know, continued to work either in as small artisans. This is the thing, too. Artisanal work doesn't completely disappear overnight. And Bruce Laurie, who's, who's an historian that teaches at UMass Amherst, has a couple of really wonderful um, books um, from uh, artisan to factory, um, points out that there were still a fair number of artisans depending on the trade and skill. Furniture making, for example, really kind of defied factory mass production in the 19th century. So you still have, for example, many very skilled, highly skilled artisanal furniture makers. Um, but increasingly, and uh, this again is documented in a number of labor histories, many of these artisans and the sons of artisans are becoming wage earners. Yes. I have, this is, I think, well presented because I haven't seen that 70 years, 80 years of history boiled down. But, like, so the skilled artisans in 1860, do they become sort of a um, client of the, the rich business owners because they're the only ones now who can afford to work? In, in part, they're able to, that's, that's right, they're able to, um, they're, some of them, you know, their goods are well known, well established. Um, they're continuing to, to work at a fairly small scale. I think the furniture industry probably best um, epitomizes the, the continuation of the small craft uh, artisan. Um, but you know, there were, there were also like uh, ironworks, small ironworks that have just a handful of skilled workers uh, up, up through the 1860s. So you don't really see the massive iron steelworks until after the Civil War. So there are certain sectors in uh, you know the production of manufacturing, where you see this persistence so of they small. They might still be servicing the wage earners. Right. As well. they, they might be as well. Uh, the other thing, by the way, it's not we, the artisanal period. I don't want to romanticize that, like you know, it was a wonderful thing to be an apprentice because some apprentices were treat, treated absolutely miserably. And you know, there's there's novels and literature that you know, in Dickens, I think, writes about you know the treatment of some of these apprentices. So it wasn't exactly a, a wonderful livelihood. I'm not saying that working in a factory was any better, but certainly um, we can kind of over um, give a rosier view of this small craft artisanal production than perhaps uh, should be. OK, so I'm going to fit, try to get through this market revolution piece here, um, the rise of the two-party systems. And you'll hear probably a lot of talk about Whigs and Democrats. And you know, really was with Jackson in the you know the 1830s, where you have the rise of the highly partisan two-party system, highly competitive. In part, it not it doesn't relate just strictly to the market revolution, but the growing enfranchisement of men. Of course, women couldn't vote. Um, at the same time, in the North, there is an increasing exclusion of blacks from voting. Those who had been you know could vote after the revolution, when after the nation was formed. Increasingly, because in fact of rival politics, um, in many cases it's Democrat, Democrats and Democratic legislatures who are vying with the Whigs to retain power. Most African Americans are in the New England anyway are voting the Whig ticket. So there are attempts to exclude and successful attempts to exclude blacks from voting um, in New York, New Jersey, and in other um, northern states. 
Okay, so again, some of the other changes I think we also teach about, you know, the rise of the separate spheres. It, we, we talk about the, you know, the earlier farm families in the 18th century where women, uh, you know, the daughters of the revolution, in fact, were bearing their equal weight, um, you know, in creating a, forging a, for a free nation, um, doing work on the, in the household on the farm. Um, but again, the market revolution, you begin to see these, this differentiation of cultural roles, spheres for women. And again, Lowell is a unique place in that, in some ways, some of those patterns are, in fact, uh, you know, do take hold. But in fact, you see some women who were at the forefront of the labor movement challenging those separate sphere roles. So um, again, it, it's not like this is happening everywhere at every level. In fact, you know, just like there's persistence artisans, there are women that are obviously defying you know, this, this larger cultural trend of separate spheres. I just love this uh, image, though, of the father greeting his wife at the door um, in the shadow of the factory, no less. And of course, the, we also teach perhaps about you know the the, the burnt over district, the great the second great awakening, um, you know the, the great um, movement toward uh, camp meetings, lyceums, the emergence of the temperance movement, of course, abolitionism. Basically, social reform, uh, you know, worry over this changing society that is, uh, you know, again, so oriented toward commerce. You know, the, the drunkards of progress is one that uh, very graphically captures, you know, warns against what can happen when you drink anything. I, I, Maine, you might, is anybody here from Maine? Has the, has the distinction of having the first... Uh, statewide prohibition law in 1851. By the Massachusetts follows the following year, 1852, with a prohibition law, but it's the, the, the high court actually throws out that law after, in about two years. So it was dry for only a couple of years here in Massachusetts. There were several towns. Winchester was dry. Well, also, years and years and years and years and years. Tr true, there was the legacy of prohibition or you know the, the dry laws continue into the 20th century, and even the blue laws of Sunday. Um, OK, so the other thing is, um, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, they, why the court would overturn. Um, but it, it could have been you know, uh, restricting enterprise. Um, it could have been on those grounds. Uh, it would be interesting to look that up to see what they're just because that decision you you can find that decision online, yeah. Um, so one of the things is also um, to point out too that um, the South does not go untouched by the market revolution, and in fact, in southern cities and even in villages that are you know in near plantations, there is there's a rise in commercial activity, um, in enterprise. Um, there's also a greater increase in the number of slaves that are being sold. Small, uh, these are not large um, groups of slaves, but a slaveholder that might hold a couple of slaves might lease out or sell his slave. It also marks the rise of industrial slavery in places like the Tredegar Iron Works. Um, you know, by the time of the Civil War, of, uh, of the 900 iron workers at Tredegar, half of them were slaves. So fairly significant number. The interesting thing, too, about industrial slavery is that often a slave, once that slave produces a certain quota that is required, um, anything beyond that, the slave actually is compensated in cash for the production. So a number of slaves are actually, a small number, are actually able to save up enough cash to, in fact, buy their own freedom or the freedom of their <coughs> wife or, or their spouse, their, their wife or their children. So, And again, so the other a aspect of the market revolution in the South is it, as I say, increases the number of slaves that are being um, bought and sold, especially among the small slaveholders. And um, there's also, I should actually point out too, uh, this, um, I mentioned here Harriet Jacobs. I don't know if you've read um, her um, slave, her, her narrative of a, of a former slave. It's really wonderful. And somebody I'll show, a f an anti-slavery, an abolitionist woman who's well known in Massachusetts, um, was involved in getting this um, Harriet Jacobs autobiography published. Her, her father was a very skilled carpenter, by the way. And in fact, he did. He was leased out and was actually making um, some of his own money and um, lent that money to 
one of, to, to basically the, a relative of the slaveholder that owned him, and he never was able to call in his debt. And so, in fact, he died um, with his children, including, of course, his daughter, still in bondage. So again, the other thing that is occurring, and then Ira Berlin writes about this quite a bit, is the um, increase in the black codes. Partly this is a response to Nat Turner's revolt in Virginia, which sends shockwaves throughout, actually sends shockwaves through the South, but also through the North. Um, so there's greater restrictions placed on the movement of African Americans. And there's also, and, and uh, you see this in various states, um, that what, in fact, determines legally a person to be classified as a Negro. So I think that's when the one-eighth um, law comes into effect in many states, including Louisiana. Okay, so um, let me turn to, the, for the last, um, uh, what time are we done here, 12.30? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to just turn to the scene in the north in Lowell. And, okay, so, so there are some really obvious connections that are, that are probably not, not surprising. The trade, you know, this is, this is typical of a steamboat full, uh, filled with cotton. You wonder how that thing is able to stay afloat. Um, so obviously raw cotton is coming north. It's also coming to, um, going to Europe. At the same time, um, this is a, you're hard to see here, but again, you get a sense of the clothing that um, slaves are wearing. Um, the, mostly these are very um, cheap kind of cloths, so-called Negro cloths. Uh, Lindsay Woolies are worn by women. Um, this is actually from a, a, a Richmond, uh, a nanny, a young girl who's about 14, um, who's taking care of, you know, a, a white her, her, the, her white master's baby. But notice the fine cotton dress there, and who knows? I mean, it's a print cloth that could be from Lowell. Um, but more commonly, the, the one of the big trades in cloth between North and South was the Negro cloth. In Lowell, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious, so roughly what percent of cotton would have gone to Europe and what percent would have come to? I'll, look, I, actually, I'll show you because I've got a good graphic of that. We'll show you that. Um, just, you know, Lowell was, in fact, involved in the uh, Negro cloth production. We're going to go by uh, our, on our walking tour. Actually, we're at the visitor center to see one of the, the introductory slide film. Yeah. Well, that's a really good question because, in fact, uh, there was a, 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 an attempt to keep some of the cotton industry going uh, along, the, in the, along the, in the Mississippi Valley. So there was a, a small amount of production, but there definitely was a cotton drought that affected the industry worldwide. There was increased production in um, India and in Egypt as well, and in other African countries. So, so one of the most obvious, again, uh, exchanges was, with, was the manufacture of Negro cloth in the north in Lowell. There was the Lowell Manufacturing Company that primarily made carpets. They didn't start actually power loom weaving carpets until the late 1840s. So they were, and they produced Negro cloth mostly in the 1830s in Lowell, mostly with hand loom uh, weavers. And then there's also a small mill on the Concord River. Have they been to the Concord River yet? Okay, so anyway, you're gonna see the little, the, the smaller mill district in wh which was one of the major producers in Lowell of Negro cloth although I don't think the mill exists anymore. So, so that, those fibers are rough woolen fibers that would go into rugs and blended with cotton. It's kind of nasty. Yeah, there, many, many uh, uh, Harriet Jacobs describes her Lindsay Woolsey uh, uh, smock. Is, uh, she, she hated it because for her it was a badge of slavery. So yeah, again, this, this is kind of a wool cotton blend that was made not so much in Lowell, but mostly in Rhode Island. Um, also, just to quickly, you know, note that um, this is Moses Brown and his brother John. Um, the, the, they were Quakers. Moses Brown becomes very active in the anti-slavery movement. His brother John continues very much to be a, a pro-slavery dealing in the, in the uh, human trade. Uh, you know, so you have these differences even within a family. Some of you may have seen um, there was a show on PBS not too many years ago that looked at the um, how the Brown family was implicated in the slave trade, and also kind of a rapprochement with, between the Brown family of today and some of the uh, slave, uh, former slave uh, members, uh, descendants of slaves in uh, South Carolina. Traces of the trade and, and, and Christian was speaking. It's not the Brown family, it's the DeWolf family. Oh, it's the, it's, that's right, it's the DeWolf family. 
but they were um, like the Browns, very much engaged. Were they bigger than the Browns? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Brown University. There's also you might recall it, it's kind of waned a little bit, but the idea of of, of paying, you know, um, c kind of like the Japanese being compensated for being placed in um, concentration camps during the war. There was a movement to pay. Um, uh, reparations for um, you know, the descendants of slaves. Um, so part of that was, Brown was actually looking at um, its, um, the roots of its involvement in the slave trade. And again, that's where some work was done on the Brown, and maybe the DeWolfs as well, is that, were they associated the with? DeWolfs did their own family research. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, so Kristen will talk about that a bit later. But um, Browns were also very much involved in um, initiating the mechanized textile industry in the United States. Um, you know, with the Slaters, with the mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which they, uh, they recruited Samuel Slater to um, improve the spinning frame, the, the water-powered spinning frame. But really, one of the major producers of Negro cloth, and there were really rich records that survive, are in um, Peacedale, Rhode Island, which is in southern Rhode Island. And um, uh, Roland Hazard, the, the Hazard family uh, maintained ownership of this mill for over 100 years, as you can see. And Roland Hazard traveled throughout the South and, you know, so in fact was very attuned to what was happening on the plantations. Interestingly enough, though, he was an abolitionist. So you might ask yourself, how can an abolitionist be, uh, you know, com dealing and benefiting in commerce with the plantations? And there's an historian named Seth Rockman who's written a couple of really uh, wonderful pieces. I think he's actually turning it into a book now. But it relates to the relationship between, um, you know, the mill owners like Hazard and their abolitionist, uh, their movement into the abolitionist um, campaign. Um, so, you know, and, the, and Seth points out that, well, uh, Hazard might have seen, too, that the manufacture of Negro cloth provided warmer clothing for slaves in the winter time. You know, it can be kind of chilly in the winter down there. So in fact, he might have felt that what he was providing was in fact benefiting the slaves. In the end, he became, again, a fairly strong abolitionist. And of course, you know, supported um, the Union during the war. And I'm sure he actually sold woolen uniforms to the Union Army as well. OK, so the view from Lowell. This, uh, so I think Bob um, Ferrant this morning may have pointed out some major, some general things about Lowell and the mills here. Um, they were unprecedented. The Waltham Lowell system was really unprecedented in its scale and size. Um, the boarding house system with the large mills is really what distinguished the Waltham Lowell system and its use of largely female workers who were paid in cash wages. Quite different from the Rhode Island system that relied very heavily on families to labor in the mills and a very large concentration of child labor as well. Um, there were still, again, places like Waltham and Lowell, there was a high level of paternalistic control. The agents who were essentially running the mills in, this, in the places like Lowell were really the most powerful men in the city and um, really exerted considerable control over the workforce, control over the boarding house keepers and the women who worked on, in the factory as well as lived in the boarding houses. I love this slide only because it's kind of some weird fantasy of some sort of, this is the idea of selling power looms. But um, again, the, the, the idea here, you know, is that, that the, the workforce was overwhelmingly female. 80% of the workforce in Lowell um, was female. And the city's um, population was, you know, like 65% female, which is unlike most other cities or towns in New England, where there's more like a 50-50 uh, rate, rate, uh, ratio from men to women. And again, you can see this is the Slatersville Mills, the 1830s and the Merrimack Mills, larger numbers of, of, of uh, children employed, much smaller compared to the 13, uh, almost uh, uh, 1,700 workers in uh, Lowell Mills, in the Merrimack Mills. And this was the largest, but by no means atypical of the other mills in Lowell. Yes? How much, how much, uh Advertising was done, or agents going out and uh, recruit, uh, recruitment efforts uh, for the Lowell Mills. I mean, or was it just a lot word of mouth? And they, they, also, how much of a radius did they? I mean, how far out would they, they go to maybe recruit? The, 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 
vast majority of women who worked in Lowell's Mills came from um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. But there were still fairly large numbers that came from Maine, Vermont, and New York. Was that word of mouth or was that? Well, they, there were, you do find um, advertisements in local newspapers, depending on the, uh, the scarcity of labor. Um, but often it's word of mouth. In fact, it's this chain migration which you see. You see so many women who come to Lowell um, who either know, you know a relative or even a, a sibling. But, but some recruiters did go out into the countryside. So how far radius was? I don't know. Um, you know, generally, you, you don't see, uh, th th there are fewer agents that are actually fanning out, and you, you don't actually see employment agents being hired until the post-Civil War period. But really, it's more through word of mouth and through advertising in newspapers um, than anything else, at least in the any vellum period. Oh, sorry. Just like immigration. Sure, yeah, yeah. And again, there's such a, you know, a wide variety of, of prints that are made here, calico cloths. Um, and uh, so this is really the major um, uh, kind of cloth fabric that's produced here. And this, is, this just returned great profits on the investments for men like Nathan Appleton, um, the Wentworths, the Higgins, the Jacksons, the Lowells, the Cabots. They benefited hugely from the you know, profits that were made in the Lowell Mills. They tended, again, of course, not to live in Lowell, but in Boston or others. Uh, yes? Do you know anything about the designers? Were they male or female? Ooh. That's a good question. Initially, they were male designers. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the finest were actually brought in from England. Um, but fairly early on, you see that becoming, in the late 19th century, a, um, one of the areas in highly skilled that women are starting to um, gain a foothold in. Okay, so you know, again, you talk about let's think about you know how much cotton is coming up to New England, how much is going to um, England and other places, um, how much speculation is being done with with uh, raw cotton. Some of you um, may have learned this already, but um, you know, it, right before, on the eve of the Civil War, just as the war breaks out, the treasurers who really were the most powerful financial men uh, in, involved with the mills in Lowell decide to sell their raw cotton reserves because the prices have gone sky high. So they empty their warehouses, they em empty their cotton storage warehouses in Lowell, and they sell the raw cotton to places like um, Fall River, Massachusetts, down river to Lawrence. And so essentially there's a cotton famine in Lowell right off, right at the very beginning of the war. The thought was that the war would be short-lived, uh -huh. cotton re would, production would re uh, return, and so there would be no problem. Well. In the end, Fall River becomes a major textile center as a result of, again, that having that uh, raw cotton that it can then turn into cloth. Um, the same thing in Lawrence. Lawrence is known more as a wool center, but the Atlantic Mills was a huge cotton mill that um, the treasurers in Lowell sold their raw cotton to. Um, so that was one of the rare cases where there was fairly you know, rampant speculation, although it wasn't the only time that treasurers sold off their raw cotton. So you can see, again, the rise in the number of cotton that's consumed in the mills over time. You know, it more than uh, triples from, uh, you know, about 1835 to 1859. This is as more mills are being built in Lowell as well. And you can see, along with the rise in the number of workers, you, then the yards of cloth produced um, per year. Okay, so here, this is the, you know, not quite the climax, you know, but uh, you know, here's, here's the, uh, the, the chart here showing, the, the pie chart showing that Great Britain, even though you know, Great Britain abolished slavery in the slave trade um, much earlier than the US, um, they're still the major consumers of slave-produced cotton. The New England mills are about, what, 18, 20%. But it's interesting, this is in the mid-1840s, of, of the uh, cotton consumed in the mid-1840s in the United States, Lowell Mills are consuming about one-eighth. So of that 18%, about one-eighth is going to Lowell's Mills. OK, so again, I, I invite you to read Thomas O'Connor's book, um, which uh, features quite a bit about Nathan Appleton, who was, uh, uh, again, one of the major financiers of the mills, not only uh, in Lowell, but before that in Waltham. And he was really the quintessential cotton Whig, very active in politics. Um, you know, you condemn capitalists like Nathan Appleton on many fronts, but the fact is he was incredibly energetic. 
He was very um, involved. He was not an absentee owner in the sense he lived in Boston, but he was very involved in the textile industry. Um, he was also very involved and very instrumental in this, essentially establishing a Federal Reserve in New England, the Suffolk Bank, which, which greatly helped to stabilize currency and it really helped. Um, you know, there's also, you know, there's interesting uh, debates between Democrats and Whigs about the nature of banking. Democrats tended to favor the chartering of lots of small banks. The Whigs were reluctant because they knew that a lot of the smaller bank bankers were printing paper that was absolutely worthless, that had no tie to specie. So in some ways, you know, Appleton is a key figure in, in bank regulation, even though we they would argue that it's free market regulation, but because it's ob obviously it's not the federal government that's involved, but in fact a, a major private bank that is in fact is lending out um, money to other banks. So he was very much criticized, um, you know, by the Democrats as you know being this um, wealthy capitalist who certainly was you know in it for his family and other wealthy capitalists. But what's interesting too is you think that in places like Lowell that is again so tied to the cotton uh, manufacture uh, cotton production in the South, how on earth could an anti-slavery movement ever take hold in Lowell, especially with the Reverend Theodore Edson, who was you might know, we'll, we'll actually we'll be going by this uh, Saint Anne's Church, which was the first church built in Lowell, by the paid for by the Merrimack Manufacturing Company um, in 1824. And Kirk Boot, who was the agent of the Merrimack uh, Manufacturing Company, brought in the Reverend Edson to, in fact, uh, you know, be the vicar here of the uh, church. Um, and so Boot, who was a, you know, the quintessential Federalist and later a Whig before he died in 1836 or 37, um, was by no means anti-slavery. In fact, he saw that as a great danger. So what's interesting is that Edson, in fact, is instrumental in forming the Lowell Anti-Slavery Society in 1834. And shortly after it's formed, they invite uh, William Lloyd Garrison and George Thompson. That's Wendell Phillips on the left there. Um, he wasn't invited. He actually doesn't be become involved with Garrison until 1836. But in 1834, Thompson, who had, just, who had met uh, Garrison in Scotland, I believe in 1832 or so, uh, Garrison's first trip to England. Um, they correspond. They become very close friends. Uh, Garrison brings Thompson to the United States in the fall of 1834. And they begin then a tour throughout the New, New England um, to promote abolitionism. And one of the first stops that they come to is Lowell. And they arrive in Lowell in um, actually October. He has a meeting. Everything's peaceful, quiet. But he's invited back uh, weeks later. And this is an interesting piece that you find. In, uh, this is from the Liberator that was reproduced in, in uh, Garrison's The Liberator. And basically warning the, the Reverend Dr. Thompson, he was neither a reverend or a doctor, warning him to really kind of stay away. And re it's respectfully yours, a citizen of these United States of America. Would it, would it like, indelible ink would that have been like, is it just an embarrassment or would that actually have put him like, well, there was, you know, the idea that you could actually be dumped in or th uh, thrown, a, you know, ink would, could be, you know, thrown in your face or so. So there was that, it was, it was more of a saying than anything else. But certainly in the Jackson era, there were people that were, in fact, you know, were, were uh, blackened or darkened with uh, ink. Uh, so, um, so citizens of Lowell, this is when, again, for Thompson's visit here, will you suffer a question to be agitated in Lowell which will endanger the safety of the Union? Um, shall, we, shall, shall Lowell be the first place to suffer an Englishman to disturb the peace and harmony of our country? This almost could have been written by an Irishman, right? Uh, so anyway, so if you were free-born sons of America, what's interesting, if you were free-born sons of America, meet at the town hall this evening and convince your southern brethren that we will not interfere with their rights, which are constitutionally protected. And again, we're going to walk, this is the old city hall, which it's wonderful that it still survives and we'll see it. Um, at, at the second meeting, of Thompson speaking in Lowell um, on the second evening of his, of, of his one of his um, really great orations. There, this is where the city uh, council met. Um, actually, at the time, Lowell was still a village, so there was just selectmen. But they had a large chamber where there was basically the largest meeting space in Lowell, public meeting space. And so while, while Thompson was giving his very you know, powerful oration against slavery, 
a, somebody threw a brick bat through the window, narrowly missing Thompson's head. And what's interesting is some, um, a woman who had been listening very calmly went and retrieved it, handed it to Thompson. He kept that brick bat with him for the rest of his life. <laughs> this was a reminder of how he was greeted in Lowell. What's interesting, again, if you read about or teach about you know, the Jacksonian mobbing and riots, they're rarely, if ever, spontaneous. They, in fact, are generally engineered and often engineered by a town's elite. Okay, whether it's you know a, a political a, a kind of a political organization, um, or whether it's a social reform group, or whether it's you know anti Mason Masons or Mason group, um, it's generally organized by an elite. But the big mystery in Lowell is who in the hell organized this you know right, this greeting for Thompson, and we don't know. For the longest time, I actually thought it was Kirk Boot. But if one thing, Boot prized order. And he was also quite an Anglophile. So he might have disagreed, and he did vehemently with, with Thompson. But I doubt that he would you know, say anything about an Englishman disturbing your peace. Because you know, there was definitely a rivalry. This wasn't that far removed from the War of 1812 or even the Revolution. So there still was some animosity between Americans and, and Eng the English. So we don't know, in fact, who, who really was, who sparked that riot. Yes? So the mill owners were, anti, were against the abolition of slavery because they were worried about their profits? That's one thing that you could conjecture. But there were, there were also, they, many of them believed, as good Whigs, that in fact slavery was constitutionally protected, as property was protected. So there were, there were, there were ideological reasons as well as self-interest that would make would prompt them to be very anti anti abolitionists. Yes. Did were there any restrictions on people or was there any fear of losing your job or repercussions if you were an outspoken abolitionist? Well, that's interesting. I'll, I'm running out of time here, but I'll say it, it, there in fact um, places like the Boot Mills where Linus Child was the agent. This is some years after Kirk Boot had died. Allowed <coughs> allowed uh, uh, petitions to circulate freely through the mills. Anti abolitionist uh, uh, abolition uh, petitions that were then sent down to Congress. Child allowed that, but he strictly prohibited any discussion or any circulation of petitions for the 10 hour day. <laughs> so he was very much against labor reform, uh, you know, the, the, the swallow of support for that. In fact, um, he in fact threatened his voters who voted the 10 hour ticket in uh, 1851. In fact, there were some hearings that were quite embarrassed him in the State House based on his voter, it was called voter coercion. Um, you know, basically threatening them to they would lose their jobs if they if they voted the Democratic or fusionist ten hour ticket. So again, but what's interesting? So we do, we don't know who was behind the um, the mobbing of Thompson in uh, December of 1834, but we do know that in 1835, thanks to the surviving broadside, and th and also through an interesting series of newspaper accounts, that there was a very large anti-abolitionist meeting in the summer of 1835. And uh, Kirk Boot is prominently featured at the head of that list. The m remarkable thing about this anti-abolitionist meeting in Lowell was that um, there were, in fact, people that got up. And Boot, Boot um, may have been one. Um, but there was also another minister that spoke. Um, but some of them would actually, in the course of their speaking, they would say, I really, I morally am against slavery. But it is constitutionally protected. What's interesting is that what got reported in some of the newspapers was that they were against slavery, even though this whole reason for having this rally was to so show support. And so in places like Richmond, Virginia, and the newspapers down there, it was reported that Lowell, who is you know, make, using our cotton, in fact, is this bastion for abolitionism. Um, and so there had some of the, you know, the agents had to go to great lengths to reassure their, in writing to the newspaper editors in places like Richmond, where the, you got the story all wrong. <laughs> okay, so one other thing, too. Bruce Laurie has written a fairly interesting, important book um, just a few years ago called Beyond Garrison. And it looks at the rise of the anti slavery movement in Massachusetts. You know, thinking about, you know, Garrison, keep in mind, uh, abolitionists like, Garrison were very much a minority. And it's quite remarkable the, the degree to which they wielded a fair amount of power in the nation and you know, sent shockwaves through the South as well. But they were, in fact, a decided minority. And if you look even at Lowell, 
the, the anti-slavery societies, it's, it's really, they, they don't even necessarily stay together that long. They seem very ephemeral. Um, and so, you know, fairly small numbers of, of members of the, and notice too, again, thinking of separate spheres, how there's a little female anti-slavery, young men's, the anti-slavery society, um, that's all men as well. So, and uh, African American, one thing about the small African American population in Lowell is that um, it, um, they, unlike some of, the, some of the others perhaps, the ministers tend to come and go, so understandably they may not be around that many, for that many years, but um, Horatio Foster, Walker Lewis, both barbers, they were firm and consistent supporters of abolitionism um, throughout their uh, lives. John Levy, also a very interesting man who um, was, again, born into slavery, um, but um, again, he, he traveled quite a bit in the Atlantic maritime trade. He had many jobs, but he was close for a short time to Garrison and was the agent of the Liberator here in Lowell. Um, so again, who, uh, who composed the anti-slavery movement in Lowell? Um, it was uh, you know, men, clergymen like the Reverend Orange Scott, a Methodist minister, who again was a very charismatic man, very great speaker. He, in fact, um, went, you know, he, he came as a Methodist minister here in Lowell when the Methodist church was, was really kind of uh, fading a bit. And he wound up getting hundreds of members into the Methodist church. Um, the interesting thing about Orange Scott, the poet John Greenleaf Whittier, who published the Middlesex Standard in Lowell for a couple of years, an abolitionist newspaper, um, they were very much involved in forming the Liberty Party. Some of you might know that Garrison uh, really eschewed politics believing that you know, political parties and politics were hopelessly corrupt. Um, so there was a very public split between men like Orange Scott, um, John Greenleaf Whittier, the formation of the Liberty Party, which Garrison had no part of. Part of it, too, was over the um, William Robinson. And his wife, Harriet Hanson Robinson, uh, is the inspiration for the story The Bobbin Girl, which some of you used. Right, right. Harriet Hanson Robinson was an accomplished writer in her own right and wrote uh, Loom and Spindle, which is still really much one of the major books we turn to when we look at the female workers in early Lowell. And then Chauncey Knapp, who again was a Vermont uh, newspaper man, came down to Lowell and um, became elected con to Congress in the mid-1850s on the, uh, on the uh, American Party ticket. So there's, yes, yeah, so in, I mentioned Lydia Maria Child, who was um, um, again a, a writer accomplished writer um, of children's books, um, uh, helped Harriet Jacobs get her autobiography published, was very involved in the Middlesex County um, Anti-Slavery Society, which was, again, all women. They held numerous fundraisers in Lowell and Concord and places like that. Um, there's a, one of the, 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 as far as the labor movement, the women go, we don't really have much in terms of the, you know, the attitudes or, or the idea, the views that w factory w women workers held but one of the very public debates we find is between a, a woman named Clementine Averill, this is not her, there's no known drawing of, of image of her, and uh, Senator Jeremiah Clemens of Alabama, who was a Whig, by the way, but he's basically writing a severe uh, condemnation of capitalism, the way wage workers are treated in, in the North, and basically upholding, um, supporting slavery in the South. It's actually a more humane institution. So Clementine Averill, writes to a New York newspaper to respond to Senator Clemens' charges. So we do have some insights, at least from one mill girl, as to her views about slavery and mill work. Who's caught in causing conflict? And again, so this is one of the, one of the very revered uh, female reformers, labor reformers in little Sarah Bagley. And, um, but she is, in fact, one of the, she was a co-editor of The Voice of Industry, which, by the way, the voice is available online now. Uh, in, in, a young um, uh, Indian from India who is now in Canada um, took it upon himself to develop an entire website around the voice of industry. And it's really, really quite good. And then you have that one from Bob and Michelle. So, so you can actually see, again, the full, uh, you know, full run of the voice of industry. And this is Sarah Bagley writing about how the fact that you know, women are able to circulate their anti-slavery petitions and they're active in that cause, but what about labor reform? Okay, so again, uh, basically who supported anti-slavery in Lowell? It was a very small number of, of um, mostly middle class, um, some of the clergy. Um, but, you know, again, this, this ebbs and flows over time. 
on this, the Fugitive Slave Act is probably the one thing that really kind of begins to change people's view of, of the meaning of slavery. And so, for example, in Lowell, we know of two cases where there were two runaway slaves in Lowell, one in 1839 and then one in 1850. Um, but, you know, again, so Fugitive Slave Act really changes mo hearts and minds about the meaning of slavery. And, that, you know, of course, the, the idea of keeping slaves, the, the slave society out of the, out of the um, Midwest, the Dred Scott decision, and then finally John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, again, so I mentioned, you know, the Underground Railroad. We, perhaps you teach about that. Um, there was a line that obviously came through Lowell and many other places in Massachusetts. Uh, this is uh, Linus Child, again, the agent for the boot mills who did permit, in fact, uh, uh, abolition tickets, uh, uh, petitions to circulate in the mills of Lowell. Um, but he's an interesting guy, too, because in the end, he comes to Lowell. He, right before he came to Lowell, he was on a, uh, a public platform with William Lloyd Garrison in Worcester. This is uh, 1844, where Garrison basically says, we, sh we should, uh, we should uh, split apart from the South. Disunion, he was advocating disunion. And w shortly thereafter, uh, Linus Child is appointed agent of the Boot Mills and quickly distances himself, fr himself from uh, Garrison. Okay, but I just want to close here with um, the Reverend Eden Foster because there was the, the, the first congregational church in um, Lowell um, was known as the Anti-Slavery Church. And he produced, after the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, he, he gave two sermons which were published and survived today. And basically, one was about the, the, the requirement, the demand that the clergy should speak out against slavery. But I think it's interesting because to say that, to put him in the same camp with Garrison is, is totally erroneous. And I would argue that Foster's view of slavery and his views of anti-slavery are much closer to the mass, vast majority of New Englanders. They feared disunion. They did not want to disturb slavery in the South. They did, in fact, oppose the expansion of slavery into the territories. Um, so, and they were hard and fast about that, but they were by no means immediate abolitionists everywhere. And so I think that really is a, a, a much more uh, accurate way of, of understanding and portraying the anti-slavery movement in Lowell, a moderate, you know, anti-slavery kind of, of, of campaign. Is, he, is that Unitarian, that church? Uh, it's congregational. Yeah. It's congregational. It is congregational, it is congregational. It is congregational. right. So, so. So again, quickly, just to wrap up here, you can, you can see in the 1860 election here in Lowell, Lincoln absolutely dominates. It's interesting that most of the mill agents, including Linus Child, support Bell, who was the unionist, and a few support Breckinridge, including the famous Benjamin Butler. Wow. And we'll probably talk about him later on, but he's a Breckinridge supporter. And Douglas, again, captures uh, much of the Irish Democratic vote here and some of the Yankee Democrats, too. And so Lincoln is elected, as we know, and um, I love this is something that's available at the Library of Congress, but the Republican Party going to the right house. You can imagine which party is, uh, you know, printing this. And you, these are, this is every, you know, crackpot and every kind of crazy reform group that is represented here in this various array from, from, from the free love to the Mormons to the um, African American. Um, you name it, and he's, they're bringing Lincoln into the lunatic asylum, you know, which is where they think he belongs. So, Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you.